So what do all these guys have in common? Uh, you say, well, they're guys from the, the Old Testament. Gideon, Samuel, David, Solomon, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Uzziah, Hezekiah. They're guys from the Old Testament. They are, they are leaders in the Old Testament, right? We've got two judges, and the rest of these guys are all kings. What else do they have in common? Well, they're all good guys. They're all good guys. I mean, most of the kings in the Old Testament are bad guys. Uh, but these are good guys. These are some of the very best guys in the Old Testament uh, we've got up here. Uh, these are these are guys that you know the Bible speaks very highly of their of their their victories, their successes, their faith, their obedience. They do a lot of things right. But something else they have in common is they all had problems towards the end of their lives. They all seem to start out better than they finish. The stories start out encouraging, and there's some kind of trouble at the end. And as I read through this. The, the, the Old Testament history this year, that just struck me. It's like every one of the good guys has trouble later in their life. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, last week we talked about King Manasseh. Remember, his story is just the opposite. He starts out really bad, and then the Lord saves him, and it turns out good. Uh, but these guys, the curve goes the other way. It, it says really good things about them, but then the end of the story is disappointing. And, and, and it's not all equally disappointing. Some have bigger problems than others. But all of them struggle to finish their lives strong for the Lord. And I consider them all to be saved men. I, I think we're going to see them all in heaven, as far as we know. Uh, we're not talking about salvation issues. We're talking struggles in the latter half of their life and their reign. And so what I want to do is first just talk through their stories. Um, and, and you know, if, if we had another three hours, we'd turn to all this and read it all in our Bibles. But I'm just going to kind of summarize it. So I've written in all the, you know, the chapters if you want to look it up for yourself and, and read the stories. But I'm just going to summarize and read from my notes uh, so we can just kind of see the big picture of the shape of each of these men's lives. And then we're going to analyze a little bit. We're going to say, okay, what went wrong? Why, why did they mess up? What, what, how do we boil it down for ourselves? How can we make it practical for ourselves? And, and then seek to apply the word that way. So we'll start with Gideon. Well, he got off to a good start, didn't he? God says, here's your first assignment. Go chop down these idols over here. <laughs> And he was scared, right? He, he said, they're, they're going to come kill me if I do that. So he does it at night. But he showed courage. It worked. The Lord preserved him. And then the job gets harder. <laughs> then the next, the next challenge is what the, the army of the Midianites is out there. And, and so Gideon gets his army together. And, and it's still way smaller than the Midianites. But you know what God does? He keeps trimming down his army until he's left with like less than 1% of the guys he started with. So he takes 300 guys into the army of the Midianites the camp of the Midianites there. with, And it, I don't even know if they took weapons. And they trusted God, and he gave them this glorious victory. So Gideon starts out great. But then trouble comes later in his life, doesn't it? He, he collects all this gold from everybody, and he makes what's called an ephod, which is a fancy priest garment of some kind. And it must have been really big, because he had lots of gold. And... And it says in Judges 8, verse 27, that Gideon placed it in his city, the city of Orpha, and all Israel played the harlot with it there, so that it became a snare to Gideon and his household. Whatever the plan Gideon had for this thing, it turned into some terrible idolatry. I, I suspect at first... Gideon kind of made this thing as sort of a convenience. It's like, well, I can go over to this little shrine thing that I've made here and, and I can seek the Lord. I can ask for God's help. I'll put it right in my hometown so it's nice and easy for me. The problem is that wasn't where it was supposed to go. The real priests, the real ephods were not up in Orpha where he was at. They were in Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle is. That's where the real priests are and so on. So he's creating his own little religious thing separate from what God had ordained. And it just turns into trouble. They start doing sacrifices. and Before long, they're worshiping false gods up there. It's just a mess. Gideon mess up. Next guy, Samuel. 
Samuel is just such a spiritual giant, isn't he? He's a judge. He's a prophet. He's a priest. From you know, God calls him there in that early age, and and he has this close relationship with the Lord all through his life. It's, he just seemed to always have a word from God in every situation. I hate to say anything bad about Samuel, but the but the guy stumbles right at the end. 1 Samuel 8, verse 1, it says it came about when Samuel was old. He's an old man now. When he was old, he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel. The name of the second was Abijah. They were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, you've grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. Samuel's problem was nepotism. He, he appointed his own sons as judges, not because they were godly, not because they were qualified, not because they were good guys, just because they were his kids. He puts his kids into the most important offices in the land. And they were moral disasters. Samuel had to know they were, they were ungodly guys. They were corrupt. They're horrible. And even when it became clear how bad they were, he wouldn't take them out of office. And eventually the whole nation rises up and comes to him and says, look, Samuel, if we've got to put up with your lousy kids, then we might as well have a real king here like all the nations. And God wasn't pleased with that, but that's the direction they end up with Saul and so on. Samuel's stumble led to all that. Sadly, a good guy stumbling in his old age. David is the next on our list. Well, David, of course, another just spiritual giant. What a hero of the Bible. He starts out as a teenager, right, taking on Goliath, and he brings down Goliath with a shepherd's sling. He's a courageous leader of men like nobody else you can think of in the Bible. I mean, people love David and follow David, and he has military victories just one after another, after another, after another. He was constantly successful. God was with him, and he has this rich relationship with the Lord, right? He's the man after God's own heart. He's close to the Lord. The Lord's leading him. He's seeking God. He knows God. He's writing all those Psalms and all this good going on in his devotional life but he finishes badly he's not a perfect guy and we know of two of his big falls and they both happen not when he's a young man but when he's an older man middle-aged or, or later we know about the sin involving Bathsheba it says in 2nd Samuel 11 it happened in the spring at the time when the kings go out to battle David sent Joab and his servants out to battle. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now an evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. And that moment of lust leads to adultery, leads to pregnancy, leads to lies and cover up and murder. Less well known is David's sin of taking a national census. This happens a little later. It seems like First Chronicles 21 uh, tells that story. It says Satan uh, stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. And David sends Joab to go do it. He says, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan. Bring me word that I may know their number. I think David just wanted to know how big this nation is I'm reigning over. How big of an army could I raise? And Joab, who is not a very spiritual guy, Joab realizes this is trouble. And he pleads with David not to do it. He says, may the Lord add to His people a hundred times as many as they are. But my Lord the King, are they not all the Lord's ser my Lord's servants? Why does the Lord seek this thing? This should, why should this be a cause of guilt to Israel? But they do the count and God is angry and ends up killing 70,000 people. It's a result of David's sin. Very bad deal. And David thoroughly repents of both of his sins, but they mar the second half of his reign. 
we move on to his son Solomon. Solomon, he had a really good start, didn't he? When he takes over as king, remember God gives him that dream and says, ask me for anything. Solomon says, well, give me wisdom that it might rule your people. And God's so pleased with that request. God says, I'm going to give you wisdom. You're going to be the wisest man in the world. And on top of that, I'm going to give you all the prosperity that you could have asked for. And so he has peace, he has prosperity, he has success and everything. I mean, it says in 1 Kings 3 that Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. He's the guy that, that writes you know, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Um, and he's the guy who builds the temple, which is a big deal. Lots of good things at the beginning of Solomon's reign, but then it goes bad. Very sad, isn't it? Uh, way back in Deuteronomy 17, God had given instructions for future kings. He said, look, future kings cannot do three things. They cannot multiply horses for themselves. They cannot multiply wives for themselves. And they can't multiply money for themselves. And Solomon does all three things. Do you know about the wives? It says, I mean, God warns them about that. He says, you, you know, you shall not associate with these nations. They shall not associate with you lest they turn your heart away after their gods. But it says Solomon held fast to these women in love. 700 wives, 300 concubines. Just crazy. And it says when Solomon was old, this is 1 Kings 11, when Solomon was old, so again, it's an old man, when he was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. And it says he went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the idol of the Ammonites. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord fully. He built a high place for Chemosh, the idol of Moab, outside of Jerusalem, and Molech, the detestable idol of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their God. And God was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord. And he says, because you've done this, I'll tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Bad end for Solomon. Sad. Read it. Asa is next. He's a, he's a good guy. He starts out great. He did, it says, he, 1 Kings 15, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He puts away a bunch of idolatry. Um, he reestablishes God's worship. He, there's that wonderful story where this million-man army comes at them from Ethiopia. And, and through prayer, Asa trusts God and God gives a wonderful victory. 2 Chronicles 14. So good things, but another bad ending. In the 36th year of Asa's reign, so right towards the very end, Baasha, the king of Israel, is about to invade. And he gets scared. And instead of, of just mobilizing the army and go fight the guy himself, which is what God wanted, instead, it says he takes the silver and gold from the treasury of the house of God and he gives all that money to a pagan king, the, the king of the Aramites, and makes a, 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 an alliance with them. And it works. Politically, it works. The Aramites scare off the, the other threat and everything settles down. But then the prophet shows up and says, oh, Asa, you've messed up here. And you've relied on the king of Aram rather than relying on the Lord. And then reminds him of the, of the deal with the Ethiopians. And now look, you trusted God and God delivered you back then. But now you've not trusted Him and you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have wars from here on. And then instead of repenting, Asa becomes angry with the prophet and puts him in prison. And he oppresses some other people at the same time. Like everybody that agrees with the prophet gets in trouble too. And then three years later, the 39th year of his reign, he gets diseased in his feet. And it says, yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought the physicians instead. He wouldn't trust God. And the next verse, he dies. That's the sad end of a good man, Asa. His son is Jehoshaphat, who's next on our list. 
Jehoshaphat, he, he becomes king at 25, and he does good. He walked in the way of Asa, his father, did not turn aside, doing right in the sight of the Lord. He removes idolatry. One cool thing he does is, is he launches a Bible teaching program. In the, he sends out priests and Levites, and they take the, the book of the law uh, of the Lord and go throughout the cities and teach the people the word. That sounds great. God gives him a glorious victory over the Moabites and Ammonites. Remember the the story with Jehoshaphat? They pray and fast and they worship and God gives this great deliverance. 2 Chronicles 20. But he too stumbles at the end. 2 Chronicles tells us that, that he allied himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who was a really bad guy. And it says that Jehoshaphat acted wickedly in so doing. And, and the, uh, the alliance is not for military purposes like they usually are. This is for trade. This is a trade deal. He says that we're going to have these ships and we're going to go, go to Tarshish and we're going to make a lot of money for ourselves. And the prophet shows up and says, no, no, God is not pleased. You've made an alliance with a wicked king. And he says, because of this, the Lord has destroyed your works and the ships are broken. It says, I guess God sent a storm and ruined the whole project. And the next verse, he dies. That's the end of Jehoshaphat. Uzziah. Uzziah was uh, was just a, a huge force among the kings of Judah. He reigned for 52 years and he was good. Um, he did right in the sight of the Lord. He continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, uh, who had understanding through the vision of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. He wins lots of military battles. He builds up the army. He's very good at organizing and improving the country. The country becomes wealthy and strong under Uzziah. It says his fame spread abroad, for he was marvelously helped until he was strong. But then the next verse says, this is 2 Chronicles 26, it says, but when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly. He was unfaithful, the Lord his God, for he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now what was wrong with that? Well, it was only the priest who were supposed to do that. He's a king. He's not a priest. And so the priests come after him and say, no, 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 king, you can't do this. Get out of here. Instead of repenting, he gets mad at him. And it says, while he was enraged at him, leprosy breaks out on his forehead. And they have to take the king and hustle him out of there. And it says, King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. He lived in a separate house being a leper. He was cut off from the house of the Lord. He abused God's house before, and now it's like he can't even go back ever again. And so that's his end of Uzziah. One more on the list, Hezekiah. Oh, he had a super good start. I mean, Hezekiah takes over. It's like a spiritual revival there. I mean, he does wonderful things. The previous guy was was really bad, and he comes in and he rebuilds the temple. He restarts the worship. He, they start doing the Passover again. They're destroying all the idols. He's getting the getting the priesthood set up. They're following the Bible, and it's, and it's great. So, Second Chronicles thirty one. This is how it describes. It. it says, "Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah. He did what was." Was good and right and true before the Lord his God. Every work which he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in commandment, seeking his God, he did with all his heart and prospered. I mean, that's, you just can't say better stuff than that about everything is going great with Hezekiah. Um, in, in, and then in the next chapter, there, he takes this wonderful stand of faith against the, the army of Assyria that's coming in and attacking them and surrounding Jerusalem, and the Lord delivers them. And, and then later on, he gets sick, and you know he prays, and God extends his life and says, I'll give you another 15 years just because you asked. But sadly, in those extra 15 years, things take a bad turn with our hero Hezekiah. Um, some officials show up from Babylon to congratulate him, and apparently they flattered him enough that he, he goes and takes them around and shows them all the treasures of the kingdom. Prophet Isaiah shows up and says, hey, you've messed up here because you've done this. These same guys from Babylon, they're going to come back with an army, and they're going to take all that stuff back to Babylon, and they're going to take your sons back there too. 
It says, Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received from God because his heart was proud. And he did repent at the end, but, but the, he still suffered the consequences in the next generation. Now, now, actually, I start out with a longer list of guys. These are eight guys, but you could, you could make the same case with, with the others, with Samson, with uh, King uh, Joash, with King Amaziah, and with King Josiah. All four of those, like the first half of the story is better than the second half. They all get worse over time. They all struggle to finish well. It's just amazing how clear God's Word makes this pattern all through these Old Testament histories. Surely you all have noticed this as you've read your Bibles. <laughs> what do we think about it? What are we supposed to make of it? Paul says this Old Testament history, these, these things are given us for our example. They're written for us to learn from. What are we supposed to learn from this? This is not what you expect, is it? See, what we expect is for, for the new Christian to be the weak one. You expect the guy that's new at it. He's, he's the one that's going to be unstable. He's going to struggle and fall and mess up a lot. And we accept. But these are guys that are mature. These are guys that have been at it a long time. These are guys that have been successful, that have seen the power of God in their lives already in lots of ways. And they get into trouble in the second half. They get into trouble when they're in their old age. So that raises the obvious question, why? I mean, what keeps going wrong? Why do these guys keep messing up like this? And it's not an academic question, is it? Right? <laughs> because we put ourselves in their spot, you know? Here, we are, we are a bunch of people in, in, in the church here. Most of us have, have not, are not brand new Christians, right? We've been, you've been a Christian five years, 10 years, 15 years, 30 years, whatever it's been. You have a lot of knowledge. You have a lot of experience with the Lord. You're not, you're not new at this. And so the question, question is, how do I keep my name off the list here? You know? Well, they, well, well, someday somebody, somebody says, oh, do you remember that Nathan Rages guy? You know, he seemed to be a pretty good guy. He was even a pastor for a little while, but man, he blew up. He fell apart. What, what happened with that guy? What went wrong? Well, God's given us His Word he says, so, that we, so that we can avoid that fate. I think there's a really serious lesson for us to learn in these old histories. And I want us to get it. I want us to get it today by God's, God's grace. Um, I think we can condense all of their problems down into four things. And that's what we're going to talk about for a little bit. You want to avoid their fate, watch out for these four things. This is probably what's going to bring you down. If one of us is going to falter at the end and put our name on the list, it probably... These four things, the same stuff that got those guys. Number one is pride. <laughs> it's got to be pride, right? David numbered the people. Why? Because of pride. Isaiah wanted to do priest stuff. Why? Because of pride. Gideon wanted to start his little religious thing on the side at his hometown. Why? Pride. He thought he was too important to have to go to the real tabernacle. To seek God. Hezekiah showing off all his wealth to the Babylonians. It was just pride. It's the classic pattern. When somebody is new and weak and needy, they're naturally humble before God. They say, they feel like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I better be real careful. I better try really hard to obey the Lord. I better get a lot of help here. I'm liable to really mess up. And they have that attitude and they stay faithful to the Lord and God blesses them. God answers their prayers. God helps them. And they begin to prosper. All of these guys experience the help of God in their young years because they were trusting Him and God was helping them just like He always does. But then as they became strong, that's, that's the very word it uses for Uzziah. When he became strong, his heart was filled with pride. That's how it works. You forget that it was God's grace all along that caused any success. And you start thinking, no, I'm the, I'm the special one here. It's because of me. 
I've got it figured out. I'm pretty great now. And so, so you naturally pray less and less because you don't need much. And you stop asking God for His guidance because you can figure out what to do. And, and you're less thankful for His blessings because you don't really see them as coming from God because I kind of did it myself. And, and you read the Bible less because, of course, you already know all that stuff. And, and it's just natural as the arm of the flesh gets stronger, you just feel less need to depend on the Lord. It's like, I can do it. I can figure it out. I can make it happen now. You don't need the guidance of the Word and the Spirit. It's like that church described in, in Laodicea in Revelation 5, 3, where it, they say, I am rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing. It's that attitude. And Jesus says, guys, you've got it completely wrong. You think, you think you've got it. No, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's reality. You're really a complete disaster because you're trusting yourself. You're full of pride. Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 12, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. That's what happened to these guys. They exalted themselves. That's easy to do when you're a king, I'm sure. It's easy to do for any of us. They exalted themselves and God smashes them all down. He humbles the pride of man. So pride, that's the number one thing to worry about. When you're strong, when you're successful, when things are going well, watch your heart for pride. And watch your choices where pride is reflected. The second problem we see with these guys is indulging the flesh. Or you can say choosing personal comfort over hard sacrifice. It's so obvious with David, right? I mean, David had been this great, great warrior. I mean, he did hard things. He took the, it was the riskiest things. And, and I mean, he's out there suffering every kind of hardship. He's living like for years in caves and stuff with his, with his mighty men. And, and by his middle age, he finally decides, that's not a very fun life. <laughs> I think I can just stay in the palace this year instead of being out with the army. And he starts indulging himself. Takes that long afternoon nap. And then he sees the woman and he indulges himself some more. And it's just all disaster right there. Indulging the flesh. You see that indulgence with Solomon. You know, this ridiculous harem of women that he accumulates. I mean, how do you defend that? And then the crazy opulence of his lifestyle. God says kings should not accumulate wealth like that. And then you've got King Asa's story. You know, he's, he's the one who instead of going to war, he hires the pagan king to do it for him. He just wanted to avoid the trouble of doing the hard thing. Now I see the same pattern with Christians all the time. When they were new believers... There's a zeal. There's a, a, a willingness to do hard stuff for the Lord. It's like, wow, Jesus has just saved me. I mean, He's done everything for me. I mean, what can I do for Him? I'm ready to do the hard stuff. Sign me up. Send me to foreign mission field, whatever. They, they have all this zeal and you're kind of trying to hold them back. Say, well, maybe you ought to kind of get some knowledge first. Maybe you kind of ought to know what you're doing first. And, they're ready to make costly sacrifices, to exercise radical faith. But then so often over time, that zeal cools way down into this sort of complacency. They're just kind of stuck there. And the preference becomes just what is safe and comfortable and easy and selfish. They say, I don't want to be under pressure anymore. I don't want to do hard stuff anymore. I, I don't want to be a living sacrifice anymore. I don't want to take up my cross again and again anymore. Let me just do the easy thing. And, and, and the shift happens gradually. I mean, it's not just like an overnight turn off a switch thing. It's gradually. It's like there in the Proverbs. Remember what the, what the sluggard keeps saying? He says, a little sleep, a little slumber a little folding of the hands to rest. And there's nothing wrong with a little nap. I kind of like them myself. 
but it's the accumulation of little soft choices that the sluggard makes and it says your poverty will come on you like a vagabond, like a robber. It all accumulates. And so there's Christians that used to always be at the prayer meeting. They used to always be at the gospel outreach or whatever. And and now it's like any excuse keeps them away. Used to be Christians that would always be first in line. Some hard service thing. They're saying, oh sure, I'll do it. I'll go. Can I do it? And Why don't they do it anymore? Well, it's just easier on the flesh not to. And they're just thinking more in terms of, let me do the minimum. Kind of what, what do I have to do to get by? Indulging the flesh, taking the soft, comfortable choices. We tend to do that more as we get older, we get more established. The the novelty wears off. These guys start doing that too. Third thing we see that they get wrong later in their life is they put family relationships first. They put their natural family first before the Lord. So that, that was Samuel's problem, right? He he preferred his wicked sons above the good of the whole nation. And it's natural. He loved his sons. He wanted something good for them. But it was not good. Solomon, he didn't just suddenly decide to become an idolater. No, he was trying to please his foreign wives. He felt sorry for them. He drug them over here from their, their native country and, and, and they wanted to worship their old gods. And, of, and he, he says he loved them. He clung to them in love. It's good to love your wives. Even if you have 700, I guess. It's good that he loved them. It's good that he cared about them. It's good that he wanted them to be happy. That isn't bad. But that led him into idolatry. He put their happiness first above the Lord. And he built them all these idols to worship at. And it was really bad. I see mature Christians make the same mistake where in some way they're putting their natural family before the Lord. And they've just got their priorities upside down. And they make bad choices later in life because of that. Here's some real life examples that came to my mind quite quickly. Um, you know, how, how, about, how about the family whose, whose whole life is dominated by their kids' sports schedules? It's like for years, they cannot do anything because it's, it's practices and games for all, all these kids. It's just that dom- I mean, is that wise? On their, is that really what God has for them? Is that seeking first the kingdom? You say, well, I can't, can't say no to my kid. Here's a husband that's clearly more spiritual than his wife. But he lets her choose where they go to church and if they go to church. Seeking to appease her rather than lead her. And bad choices ensue. We've seen that. Here's a middle-aged couple. They could be very useful in the kingdom of Christ. They maybe have 15, 20 more good years. You know, maybe they're retired from the job. They're freed up. They're still in good health. It's like, guys, you could do a lot for the kingdom. And you give them this pep talk, and you know what their answer is? Yes, but we would never move away from our grandkids. I've heard that. And it just breaks my heart. It's like, who's against? We all love grandkids. Grandkids are great. But the kingdom of Christ is more important than that. If you've got a little time to serve the Lord, why don't you seek first the kingdom of God? These are mature Christians like you have all this knowledge and all this experience. You could do so much good. But grandkids keep them back. So we all agree our natural family is important, of course. you know, These relationships are important. We should love our wives and love our kids and love our grandkids. But remember how hard Jesus came down on this thing. I mean, you know the verses where he says, no, you've got to hate all those people. And when you say, no, it doesn't mean hate, it doesn't mean hate. We, we, prefer the, we prefer the one in, in Matthew where it says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
So we like that version a little better, but it's the same idea, folks. It's Jesus comes first. And, you, and, and sometimes you've got to say no to your kids or your wife or whoever. Say, no, the Lord wants me to do this hard thing. And I'm going to follow Him in it. And it makes the difference between the, the latter part of your life being, being full of, of fruitfulness and joy or just kind of treading water and going through those years. If somebody says that getting married and having kids has killed their zeal for the Lord, has ruined their personal walk with Christ, then I say you're doing it wrong. That's not God's will for you, for your family to ruin your walk with Him. Yeah, things get more complicated, sure. But there's a way to seek first the kingdom and be faithful to our spouse and our children. We can still put Him first. We can still seek His face in any family structure we find ourselves in. A fourth thing, the last one I'll talk about that gets these guys in trouble is what I'm calling friendship with the world. Friendship with the world. Jehoshaphat here, he's the one that, that made that alliance with, with this bad king uh, to do this trade deal. And, and, and the problem with it wasn't that it was bad business. The problem was he was making a deal with an evil counterparty. God says, no, I don't want you entangled that way. Asa, he's the one that makes the deal with the Arameans to, to provide security on his, his northern border. Most of Solomon's marriages were, were probably the result of political alliances with all these other countries that he's trying to keep peace with. So you marry a bunch of people from those countries and, and, and then everybody's afraid to go to war. But God made it very clear. I mean, as you read through the Old Testament, God keeps saying again and again, watch out for your neighbors. Watch out for all those wicked, idolatrous countries all around you. He says, don't intermarry with them. Don't follow their ways. Don't become like them. Watch out for this. And yet here are God's leaders that are joining up with these worldly Nations, And I'm sure they said things like, you know, these are nice people. <laughs> these are nice people over there. You know, they have little different ideas about God, but they're nice people. And, and we can do business together. We can protect each other from invasion. Um, you know, we shouldn't be so narrow and standoffish. But God is never pleased with those things. It's like every time they try that stuff, it never works in the Bible there. And you and I are tempted in similar ways. I mean, obviously, we're not, we're not politicians entering into deals like, like they were. But we're tempted to be friends of the world in other ways too. A lot of it comes down to, am I willing to bend the standards of God enough to fit in better with worldly people? It's hard always being the oddball, isn't it? It's hard being the one that's kind of mean and judgmental and you know in the minds of others and and being out of step with the culture bearing the offense of Christ. It's hard. Oh, those seem like such nice folks over there. Can't we get along somehow? It's like sure, you can be friends with the world as long as you are willing to compromise on truth and righteousness. And sadly, I mean, you see, you see mature Christians, even preachers, preachers have been good for a long time. Later, later in life, they compromise stuff that they knew good and well what the Bible says. But it's things of the cult that are hot button issues in the culture, and they bend, they bend towards the culture rather than following what's really clear in the Bible. So you know, stuff like stuff like divorce, the Bible's real clear on that. Stuff like homosexuality, the Bible's clear. Um, things like well, women's roles in marriage and in the church, uh, a lot of controversy there. So they bend towards the world. How about just the exclusiveness of Christ? That Jesus says, I'm the only way to the Father and everybody else is lost. You know, that sounds terrible to say that. I mean, in a tolerant age like ours. 
And so you soften that up and say, well, maybe there's another, maybe, you know, the sincere people in other religions got some way of getting to God. It's a danger the Scripture warns us against. There in Romans 12, verse 2, he says, do not be conformed to this world. And, and, and the, the, the imagery there is being pressed into a mold, the world pressing you into its mold. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not becoming more like the world, but being transformed to be more like Jesus. And then James, he, he's even stronger with this. He says in James 4, 4, you adulteresses, do you not know friendship with the world, his hostility toward God? Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. These, these leaders that tried to be friends of worldly folks, they, they all get into trouble for us. And we'll get into trouble too if we're compromising on what's clear from God. Why do so many Christians become unfruitful later on in their lives? And it's, it is a mystery, isn't it? It's the, it's the new Christians that seem to have the most life, the most zeal, they're accomplishing the most, and yet those with the most knowledge and experience that ought to be the most effective actually in the kingdom so often are on the sidelines doing nothing. Like nothing's happened. There's no impact from their lives. There's no fruitfulness. There's no flow of the Spirit impacting anybody. And I think very often it's the same four things that the devil uses to get them. It's pride. It's soft, fleshy choices rather than the hard sacrifice. It's what we just talked about. It's friendship with the world. And it's the family relationships getting in the way somehow. And having wrong priorities there. And so, if we want to keep our name off the list, we do well right now. Examine ourselves. Say, am I, am I tempted in some of these things? Am I doing some of these things? Am I, have I made bad choices in some of these? Am I heading the, down the same path that got some of these really... I mean, these guys were all... These are greater saints than us. And they fell. I mean, these are some of the greatest saints in the Bible. And they fell. They got in trouble. They stumbled because of these things. He thinks he stands. Take heed lest he fall. So examine ourselves. Repent of anything that's out of place. And, and yet I want to encourage us. <laughs> I mean, you read all these stories and you think, well, this just must be impossible. It must be impossible to finish well. Everybody just falls apart. No, the Bible does not say that. Um, I had a verse on the screen. The Apostle Paul says, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He comes to the end of his life. There's no regrets. He didn't fall apart. God kept him. And then there's a great verse in the Psalms. This is the best verse on aging in the Bible, I think. Uh, Psalm 92, verse 12. You guys don't care about verses about aging. But some of us are more closer to that part of life. Psalm 92, verse 12, The righteous man will flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. So that part we're used to. Righteous people flourish. And then the next verse, so Psalm 92, 14, They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall still be full of sap and very green. <laughs> So it's not like you just you kind of get old and dry up and wither away. He says, no, the, the, the normal thing, the expectation should be you become increasingly fruitful as you get older. You know the Lord better. You know the Word better. You have all this experience of, with Him. You, ought, you, you get stronger. You become more effective. And we know people like that. I know we all do. You can think of saints in their, their 70s and 80s. They haven't shriveled up. I mean, maybe their, maybe their bodies have a lot of problems. Maybe their minds aren't as sharp. But they, they're, 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 they're oozing with the reality of God when you're around them. I mean, there is, there, is, there is love and joy and peace there. They are thrilling to be around. They're just a blessing everywhere they go. 
they're full of sap and very green, right? He's like, I want to be like that. Uh, that verse in Hebrews about, about running the race, right? It says, run the race with endurance. It means you go all the way to the end. You don't, if you don't finish the race, you never win it. So we want to finish. We want to be like that. Uh, but boy, the devil's shooting at us. He wants to get us off the battlefield. He wants to keep us on the sidelines uh, and make us ineffective. The devil will lie to you and say, you know, you've been a Christian 5, 10, 20 years and, 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 and pretty much your growing's over. Okay, You're pretty much, the way you are now is the way you're just going to be. And, and from here on the next 40, 50, however long, you're just going to kind of tread water, sort of be the same status quo. That is a giant lie. That is not reality. I mean, I mean, the Christian, the Christian ought to be growing just as fast after they've been with the Lord 50 years as they did at the beginning. Um, I mean, really, think of it. I've, I've been trying to preach some of this stuff this year because I'm seeing it really clear right now that, that every time you see a gap between, between what the Bible describes as the Christian life and the promises of the Word and the, and the commands of the Word and your own life is over here and it's not matching up to what the Bible describes. That gap represents an opportunity for growth, right? It's like, well, well Lord, you, must, you, you mean for me to be over here. You mean for me to be experiencing your life and your promises and your power like you describe here. I want more of that. That means I can grow in this. Lord, you want me to obey you more than I'm obeying you. That means I can grow that way. I think there's tons of opportunity for each one of us to grow in the Lord this year. And 20, if we're all still alive 20 years from now, I'll say the same thing. There's opportunities for you to grow in the Lord. Then it's thrilling. The, the adventure doesn't, doesn't diminish over time. You read the great biographies of the saints and they don't experience that at all. Right? God just becomes more and more glorious to them over the years. I mean that song, do we, do we think that song is true? I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. I mean, do we think that might actually be true? That that could be not a lie? You've heard me say this before, but I, I think it's a helpful way to think of it. I, I don't want to ever be looking back to some time when I was really close to the Lord. Say, well, well, I can remember six months ago oh, things are really good, or two years ago things are really good, or you know, that first year after I was saved, things were really good. But I want to feel like, no, right now, <laughs> right now is really good. You know, why can't it be right now? Why can't right now be the best it's ever been between me and the Lord? I mean, we say that in marriage. It ought to be that way. Same way with our relationship with Jesus. So, obvious exhortations to us like that. But I just want to close this on a gospel note if I could. Um, can we connect this to the gospel somehow? You think we can? I think it's really simple. These, these guys here, these are some of the greatest saints in the Bible. Presumably some of the greatest saints that have ever lived, right? And, and none of them were perfect, were they? I mean, they all stumped. They, none of them completed their course perfectly. The very greatest, most mature saints, they stumble, they fall. None of us can do it perfect enough, can we? None of us can get to heaven under our own power. None of us can please God with our own righteousness. None of them could save themselves by their own righteousness. The only way they're going to end up in heaven is they trust God. They're saved by grace through faith, just like us. And that's our only hope. Our, our righteousness cannot be our own righteousness. It's got to be the righteousness of the Lord. If, if I just had to earn 1% of my salvation by doing something right, I think I'd mess up the 1%. And I think we all would. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. The song says we feel that. 
We feel our weakness, but we rejoice that our salvation does not depend on our obedience. I'm so glad God doesn't say, well, you can go to heaven if you live the last 20 years of your life right. All these guys wouldn't have made it if that was the rule. But we trust in the perfect work of Jesus. These guys did not finish their course perfectly, but Jesus did. Right? Right? 33 years, perfect. And He gets to the cross. He gets to the Garden of Gethsemane and He's saying, Father, not My will, but Your will be done. He perfectly surrenders to the Father. He goes to the cross. He's hanging there. And He declares at the end, it is finished. It is. He completed it. They didn't complete their course perfect, but Jesus did. Jesus did. And, and, and our trust is in Him. Our righteousness is in Him who did finish. Who did perfectly everything He was supposed to do. And so we rejoice in the Gospel. We rejoice in the robe of righteousness that covers me forever. Amen.